Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to take your seat. Ladies and gentlemen, dear viewers on the internet, welcome to today's event on the new oil of the 21st century, just plain water. We have it over there, we have it there. Increasingly scarce, increasingly demanded, increasingly contested. Is water an accelerator of conflict or tension, or rather, is conflict a catalyst for peace and prosperity and sustainable development? We're going to shed light on the humanity's greatest challenge ahead of us in the face of climate change. Today's event marks the beginning of the Blue Peace Days at the Swiss Pavilion at the Expo Dubai. And it also marks the beginning of the Water Month at Expo Dubai. If you do not know Blue Peace, I promise you, tonight by 8 p.m. you're going to know it. This event is divided into three parts. First, we're going to hear some introductory remarks, followed by a series of keynotes, three keynotes. Then we're going to have a coffee break, or let's say a water break, for you, for us to digest what we have heard, to chat with, with your fellow participants. Before we move on, to a panel discussion where the panelists, the keynote speakers and panelists from the region will analyze the pivotal importance of water cooperation and they will provide insights from, daily, from their daily water endeavors. We will finish this day by inviting you all, the panelists, the speakers and the entire audience unfortunately not our dear viewers on the internet, to a tour through the Swiss Pavilion. This tour will start at the entrance and it will finish with the Blue Peace exhibition that will open up at our arrival. So it is my pleasure to welcome you and it's my pleasure also to welcome and to announce the honorable presence and contribution of the following representatives who will speak to us in this first part. I do start, and I have to, excuse me. I start with His Royal Highness, Prince Hassan, Prince El Hassan bin Talal from Jordan, who's the chair of the Policy Advisory Committee of the Blue Peace Middle East Regional Mechanism. He was also a member of the Global Panel on Water and Peace, which came up with this landmark and pivotal report, A Matter of Survival. I would like to welcome also all the excellencies among us. I would like also to welcome His Excellence, Mr. Massimo Bacci, Ambassador of Switzerland, to the United Arab Emirates, welcome. We will then have three keynote speakers. It will start with His Excellence Dr. Danilo Turk. Danilo Turk is a Slovenian diplomat, a professor of international law, a human rights expert, and a political figure who served as the president of Slovenia from 2007 to 2012. Since February 2018, he's also the lead political advisor to the Geneva Water Hub. 
We will then have a video recorded introductory speak by ICRC president Peter Maurer. Unfortunately, Peter Maurer had to cancel his visit to this and his participation to this event. As you can might know, uh, we are in a difficult time, uh, mainly because of, these, of the outbreak of the war in the Ukraine. He has canceled his participation in person here. But he will have a keynote speech, which will be then complemented by an ICRC representative, representative from the region, Mr. Igor Malgrati, who is a Water and Habitat Senior Advisor for the International Committee of the Red Cross in the Middle East, based in Maman, Jordan. Finally, we'll have Her Excellence, Ambassador Patricia Donzi, who is the Director General of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, which is part of the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. Prior to her engagement with SDC, she has served and she's been with the International Red Cross also since 1996, where she served as a delegate with increasing responsibilities in the Balkans, in Peru, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Angola. Now I want to stop and I would like to ask uh, Ambassador Massimo Bacci to have a few introductory words. Mr. Bacci, please, the floor is yours. Royal Highness, Excellencies, dear friends of the Swiss Pavilion, it's such a pleasure for me uh, to welcome you today on the Swiss Pavilion uh, on a very hot, beautiful Saturday. I've been here a few times already and had the chance to accompany many of uh, our partners and our events to the Swiss Pavilion and so all of them, all of us, I would say, uh, gave a huge contribution to make uh, this uh, pavilion and this expo a driver of uh, change. I keep saying from the very the beginning that uh, uh, at expo we didn't come here mainly to sell any of our product, we mainly came here to build values and to share values among friends. And that's what we are doing uh, today. And I must say I was so proud now to be able to bring water uh, to the Swiss Pavilion and today we need it uh, very uh, much and not because of the temperature uh, only. Uh, we have been giving, the Swiss Pavilion and Switzerland in general, we have been giving a major contribution to all thematic weeks of this expo. Uh, it goes without saying that it was uh, a task uh, for us to do that also uh, for water and that's what we're going uh, to do uh, today. You know, I grew up uh, in a country, uh, Switzerland, where uh, water was uh, and is uh, largely available, extremely abundant. I used to grow up and uh, play in uh, uh, rivers up in the mountains uh, to uh, swim in our beautiful lakes. And uh, I was used to, and I continue to uh, ski down the wonderful slope on our uh, mountains. But with time, I realized how fragile this environment is and how water-related issues are uh, fragile. I learned, for example, that in Switzerland, we produce two-thirds of our energy mix with water. And this water comes uh, from uh, the glacier that we have in Switzerland. But those glaciers are melting. And suddenly, we realize how fragile we are. I've been traveling around uh, for 30 years now within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I served in many countries where people realized exactly the same, how fragile we are also because of water-related issues. I was serving in India where water is becoming a kind, clean water is becoming a kind of a luxury good for so many people. I was serving in Morocco, where water is of a paramount in importance and it makes difference 
for agriculture. Therefore, I think that uh, our initiatives that we want to share with as many of you we can related to Blue Peace is really an initiative can make a major change on the life of so many uh, of us. And therefore, once again, I'm so much proud that you have been able and willing together to, gay, to support uh, this uh, issue. You as a person and the organization that you uh, represent. And therefore, I would like to thank again all of you. I would like uh, to thank the Swiss Development Corporation for organizing this event together with all our partner and of course I would like to wish uh, you uh, good luck and uh, fruitful discussion today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, yes, uh, because of the temperature, I think that for those who wish uh, to remove jackets, uh, feel uh, free to do so. Thank you so much. Many thanks, Ambassador Bocci. We will now have our first introductory words by His Royal Highness Prince El Hassan bin Talal on a video. Because of the light, you might not see um, here in person, but we all can all listen to his words, which are very wise in our views. So please, could you start the video? May I at the outset recognize the presence among you of uh, Massimo Baji, Senor Baji, and uh, Dr. Reem Al Hashimi, both uh, lead uh, personalities in this fantastic meeting in Dubai, with which I acknowledge and recognize as being the vehicle for uh, the many agencies who have participated in uh, the thought process, and in particular, the Swiss Agency for uh, Development and Cooperation, which uh, has come a long way with us in the context of Blue Peace uh, alone. I go back to 2011 and uh, recognize that the UN Water Development uh, Report, valuing water, of uh, 2021, last year that is, uh, determined at, uh, to achieve um, uh, concrete results in terms of universal success to safe drinking water and sanitation was remarkably effective. I want also to thank UNICEF for uh, the emphasis on child survival and uh, once again, when uh, talking of unsafe water and sanitation, which causes malnutrition, making children even more vulnerable to disease in parts of Yemen, for example. Acute malnutrition rates among children are under the age of five, where the highest level ever recorded in uh, late 2020. Of course, I could go on in referring to the Gaza Strip, the state of Palestine, large amounts of pollution, pollutants, including soil sewage, sewage, raw sewage, and wastewater have contaminated scarce groundwater. With around 66 million people in the MENA region and lacking basic sanitation services, we're talking about water not only in terms of uh, the status quo, but in terms of the vulnerability-based uh, approach that uh, results, hopefully, in, in, in development. The report of the Secretary General on Sustainable Development Goals, of course, gave us uh, much to think about, but both SDGs related to water and peace require constant and renewed efforts. And therefore, once again, thank you, Dubai Expo. The challenges facing water resources are not new. Global water withdrawals have tripled over the last 50 years. And the aqueduct projected uh, water stress country ranking mentioned 36 countries worldwide that are facing extremely high levels of water stress. 16 out of the 36 are in the Middle East, and seven of them, Palestine, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Turkey, and Jordan, are in the Levant region. So I would like to remind all of you that since 1967, 
the situation has worsened, where in fact uh, the river flows in Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey have decreased by 50 to 90 percent. Groundwater table declined and freshwater quality deteriorated due to salinity and pollutants. No one can neglect the effect of climate change in this meeting in uh, Dubai in inducing water scarcity and security as a consequence. Climate change has uh, consequences and most models forecast a 10% to 20% climate induced reductions in water supplies for Lebanon, Iraq, Turkey, Jordan and Iran. So I would like to uh, conclude my brief remarks to you. I wish I could have been there myself, but uh, circumstances made it uh, difficult. Maybe next time we can meet here or there. But transboundary water cooperation needs to be intensified with political commitment and concrete development projects that can make a real difference to the life of vulnerable populations. The water co cooperation quotient has shown that African river basins rank at the highest level with their emphasis on political and developmental cooperation. The countries in West Asia have to seek inspiration from this and create a regional mechanism for water cooperation as proposed in the first Blue Peace Report of 2011. Let us hope that we can be talking in the future of Blue Green Peace uh, action plans and uh, put uh, the intrastate and interstate water management, management, especially with climate change impacts, water diplomacy, adopting and applying water, food, energy nexus, and data utilization, data, 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 and knowledge transfer into uh, a regional strategy for development. Cooperation is a must and synergies must be built, and I know you have what it takes to take the next mile in this long journey. Thank you all very much. I would like to thank His Royal Highness for these powerful introductionary remarks. And I would like now to welcome Dr. Danilo Turk, who, to present us the first keynote speech Mr. Danilo Turk, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, and activists, activists of the Blue Peace Movement, as you see, I consider myself being one of you, being one of us. Uh, let me start by saying it's a great pleasure and honor to speak today at the launch of the Water Month of the Swiss Pavilion of the Expo in Dubai, an event of high symbolic importance. And I'm grateful to Switzerland, to Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation for hosting this meeting and to the government of the United Arab Emirates who have joined forces to emphasize the water as a catalyst for sustainable development and peace. Let me explain that I am speaking today on behalf of the Geneva Water Hub, the organization based in Geneva, which helped organizing and preparing the work of the global high-level panel on water and peace, which I had the honor to chair in the years 2015 to 2017. We produced a report called A Matter of Survival, by which we emphasize the dramatic importance of water for present and for the future. And we have explained in that report, as was emphasized also in the invitation for the meeting today, that the world is facing an unprecedented global water crisis. And that we have to remind ourselves of two disturbing features. First, the sheer scale of the crisis and second, the existential stakes that that crisis imposes on humankind. I'll just go briefly through some basic data. I would like to say that I agree with the preceding speakers, with the ambassador, with uh, His Royal Highness Prince Hassan, who spoke before me, that uh, we all have to be aware of the dramatic nature of the problem the world is facing. 
The, today, around 2 billion people lack access to safe drinking water. 2 billion people. And this number is going to grow with the growing population and with the effects of human-induced climate change. We also have to consider that the next few decades will require 50% more food and durable energy production, again, something that would require massive amounts of water. And at the same time, we have to be aware of the depth of the problem. Because for humans, the only thing whose absence kills you faster than the absence of water is the absence of oxygen. So this is the comparison we have to keep in mind. And water has no substitute. The only substitute for water is really water. And of course, water has a long history, history which has been shaping civilizations, but history which can now turn into a direction in which large parts of the planet will be uninhabitable. And that also has to be taken into account. Water is the main medium of climate change. And the adaptation to climate change will require major adjustment in situations, in particular in areas of water scarcity, but also in areas of massive floods, problems, disasters, which were not experienced in previous history. And then on top of all of this, uh, the nature of contemporary armed conflict has to be taken into account, where water is increasingly either used as a weapon of war or more, even more frequently as an object of attack. In the current crisis conflict in Ukraine, we have seen, sadly, how for many years water installations have been attacked and how that has contributed to deepening of the crisis and to the scale of armed conflict that we see today. In these circumstances, new approaches are necessary as far as the armed conflicts are concerned, the triple nexus approach combining development, humanitarian assistance, and peacemaking is something we need to be aware of and we need to develop further. Now, I have sketched some of the features of the big picture of the water problem today, something that requires a new paradigm relating to water use, water management, and international water cooperation. All this has to be brought much higher on the international agenda. Now, the conceptual basis, a point of departure for that new paradigm already exists. It is expressed in the right to save drinking water, which was recognized by the United Nations General Assembly and by the United Nations Human Rights Council in 2010 as a fundamental human right. Five years later, the General Assembly recognized the right to sanitation as a distinct human right. Now, are these pronouncements only an expression of lofty human aspirations, or should they constitute a real basis for effective policy making and legal obligations? Now, I think that it is broadly recognized that the latter should be the case. All states and all businesses are under the obligation to refrain from unjustifiable interfering with the enjoyment of the human right to save drinking water. Depletion of water resources, over-extraction, diversion, and pollution are not un only undesirable practices. They constitute a threat to human rights and have to be dealt with as such. Now, let me refer to another important international platform that has developed in the past years. The task to ensure access to water and sanitation for all by 2030 was declared as the Sustainable Goal 6 by the United Nations Agenda 2030. And that agenda uh, has defined water not only as a goal in its own right, but also a sine qua non for, for all other rights, uh, for other goals, from food security to global health and to goal of ensuring peaceful and inclusive societies. Now, the mentioned principles testify to the awareness of the international community regarding the importance of water. But the, the, the actual practice remains completely inadequate. Today, the realization of Sustainable Goal 6 on water is generally understood as being badly off track. This assessment is shared by water specialists, by policymakers, and by diplomats world over. 
The situation today already points to grave humanitarian problems that will affect humankind in the future. And we have to think in this context in particular about the most vulnerable and about the young people and children, the future generations. Now, it is estimated that by 2040, one in four of the world's children under age of 18, some 600 million people, will be living in areas of high water stress. Water is a requirement for public health that we have discovered again during the COVID-19 pandemic. And waterborne diseases continue to represent a major global health problem, in particular in areas affected by armed conflicts and particularly affecting children. And all these developments and peace challenges, in all these developments, women and girls suffer disproportionately. Just listen to this piece of information. Women and girls in low-income countries spend about 40 billion hours per year collecting water. Now, this is equivalent to the annual work hours of the entire workforce of France. That's the comparison. And as the water crisis deepens, the problem is going to be even more dramatic. Now, let us also understand one thing, the importance of young people. And they are already becoming restless. And restlessness can lead to unrest. Unrest, ladies and gentlemen, is the voice of the unheard. The world, the world has to hear the youth and engage youth in policy making and in the search for solution. So the question is what to be done in the current deeply disturbing situation? What can governments of the world do? What can we do? What can the government of Switzerland do? What can our host, the United Arab Emirates, do? What the experts who are with us today at this meeting eh, can do? Now, it is clear that international cooperation is of vital importance. It is also clear that the international cooperation need to be inclusive, involving not only government, but also private sector, the academia, and civil society. And that civil society engagement has to give voice to women and youth. But what are the actual solutions in our era? What should be done to make water management and water cooperation a significant catalyst for sustainable development and peace? I'm convinced that the discussion today will help us articulating specific answers to this. And let me in this context make two suggestions, one related to transboundary water cooperation and the other to questions of water resources and infrastructure during the armed conflicts. Now, first on transboundary water cooperation. Three quarters of the United Nations member states share rivers and lake basins with, the, with their neighbors. And there are two general multilateral UN conventions relating to transboundary water cooperation. This is an example of the needed peaceful cooperation. And we know many examples in many parts of the world which show how important for peace the cooperation, the transboundary water cooperation has been. Just by example, I should mention the Indus Water Agreement between India and Pakistan, the Senegal Basin Organization involving four countries, and there are many other examples. But there is still much work to be done in this regard. Transboundary water cooperation is an unfinished business. There are places in Central Asia, Middle East, Latin America, and elsewhere where much more needs to be done. Transboundary water cooperation should expand and should include innovations. Now, this is particularly necessary in the Middle East, which, as we have just heard from Prince Hassan, needs more work because of the fact that it is the, one of the most water-stressed areas of the world. I would like to emphasize in particular that the climate-induced decreases of precipitation and climate-induced increases in evaporation are already adding disturbing new grounds for depletion, for, for fear of further depletion of underground water and on other, of other water. More frequent and intense droughts add to desertification, the loss of crops, and decreasing agricultural production. Now, all this calls for improvements, for new policies, for more ambitious policies. The majority of the available freshwater resources here in this region are of transboundary kind. They include aquifers, not at least the Umarat Huma Daman, which is key to United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Oman, as well as, of course, transboundary surface waters. 
A few surface water systems are governed bilaterally and they can be improved and expanded. But no comprehensive, equitable, regional agreement governing water quantity and quality exists in the region as yet. Now this, in my opinion, is a shortcoming that should be addressed in the region where water stress level is particularly high. In fact, one has to look for ambitious examples elsewhere and draw inspiration from that. The regional system of water cooperation in the Senegal River, the OMVS, is an example of an ambitious, innovative, and visionary approach that should inspire. In the Middle East, the vision and ambition should go even further, given the needs and the almost limitless natural, financial, and human resources that exist in the region. What is needed is a vision and political will. And the SDC's Blue Peace Middle East program is well targeted in this regard. And I'm delighted that we shall hear more about the SDC suggestions, proposals from its director, Madam Patricia Danzi, who will speak in a short while. Now, in the past, suggestions have been already made, and I would like to make one, one illustration. And the, it was suggested that the inspiration should come not only from the examples such as the Senegal River Corporation, but also from Europe, in particular the coal and steel community that connected the two essential resources in Europe for the post-war reconstruction in Europe. Now, one may ask, what do these examples have in common? Well, what do they have in common is political will and foresight. This approach uh, laid the foundations for the subsequent intense cooperation and economic integration of Europe. And as it looked initially as a purely practical, purely needed uh, cooperation in two important basic resources for Europe, it later became a basis for fast-growing and far-reaching economic integration and also political integration. Now, in the Middle East, the sea and sun could be the way forward. Desalination of seawater is already a major industry in the region. In the current stage, it is powered mostly by energy of hydrocarbons. A more ambitious and long-term approach would harness solar power as a permanent source of energy. Now, it would be wonderful if creating a water and energy community would be starting to grow. This sounds futuristic, but research, know-how, and the relevant resources already exist. What is needed is the political will to move forward. As the European example of coal and steel community has shown, innovative cooperative arrangements can go a long way towards establishing new level of interdependence, a new political reality. And obviously, when I'm talking about uh, sun and sea, I should also say this does not replace the existing and future strengthening of cooperation in the basins of the large rivers in the region. And here are some of the most eminent experts on the subject, and I hope we shall hear more from them as we proceed with our conference. Now, let me turn to my second suggestion relating to water in armed conflicts. The problem um, of water in armed conflict has been recognized widely. Two years ago, the Geneva Water Hub published an important document, the Geneva List of Principles for Protection of Water Resources. The list systematized the applicable principles of international humanitarian law, water law, and human rights law. The Geneva Principles now represent a real manual to be used by policymakers, humanitarian workers, and most important, by military commanders. Much work has been done uh, by way of advocacy of these principles, including in cooperation with the United Nations, ICRC, UNICEF, and with other humanitarian organizations. Just two days ago in Geneva, we had the latest among the meetings of representatives from humanitarian organizations, including the International Committee on the Red Cross and several militaries to define further action. And I'm happy to see with us Mr. Mark Zayton, the director of the Geneva Water Hub, who was guiding that conversation and will be able to tell us later in the afternoon about its, the discussion and findings and proposals that have been made. The international humanitarian law, and I would like to really emphasize this very strongly, must be upheld. And we have to remind ourselves that states must respect 
and ensure respect for humanitarian law in all circumstances, as the common Article 1 of the 1949 Geneva Conventions stipulate. The, these days, of course, the armed conflict in Ukraine shows a devastating effect of modern warfare, including on water infrastructure, which has been devastating in the past years in the eastern Ukraine. According to, to a recent urgent appeal of the ICRC, uh, an appeal made a, a week ago, before the current level of hostilities, at that time more than one million people on either side of the line of contact have been affected by attacks on water infrastructure. Hospitals, among other institutions, were affected as well. So it's clearly one of the most dramatic aspects of the war in, in that part of the world that have to be that have to be given special attention and solutions have to be sought. Now, most of the contemporary armed conflict are protracted armed conflict, and the water systems have been, that have been inadequately managed even before the conflict are particularly vulnerable. When such systems break down, people are exposed to severe shortages of water and also to the competition among the alternative private water providers. Water crisis that was initially caused by armed conflicts become, becomes a protracted water disaster as the effects reverberate onto essential services and onto, onto people's health and livelihoods. A comprehensive policy response is needed, and only by addressing both the ongoing humanitarian crisis and pre-existing development challenges, it becomes possible to stem the decline in service delivery and in building resilience to future hazards. This is particularly necessary in protracted urban warfare that represents an increasingly prominent characteristic of contemporary armed conflicts. In such circumstances, the traditional humanitarian assistance has to be combined with the work of development actors and, where possible, with the security providers. Peace building and repair of water infrastructure cannot be simply delegated to a post-conflict phase because definitive cessation of violence may simply not be possible over a long period of time. Problems like this are increasingly addressed by a number of international humanitarian and development actors, including the Red Cross, UNICEF, the World Bank, the European Union, OSCD, and all these actors have come together to put forward something that is called a triple nexus approach, an approach that combines humanitarian action, development work, and diplomacy aiming at peace. And I'm sure that later we shall hear from the ICRC representative, Mr. Igor Malgrati, more about the current efforts of the ICR and the humanitarian community more broadly. The knowledge and experience which is gained in this process may not be always very encouraging, but it is a necess necessary basis for reflection and action that is much needed. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude. The range of water-related problems, from the ones caused by global warming to the acute situations of contemporary armed conflicts, demonstrate the drama of water today and show us a rather grim picture for the future. The world is not yet prepared, is not yet prepared to face the problem at the entire front. The time is running out. This is why meetings like the meeting today are so timely and important. This meeting shows that the Swiss and United Arab Emirates governments aimed very well in hosting the meeting today. I wish you much success in your discussion and above all in your future work and I'll be happy to rejoin this meeting as a panelist in the second part of our program this afternoon. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Dr. Turk, for this very comprehensive outline at the beginning, uh, which shows the scale and magnitude of the problem. I don't want to com comment further, but I would like to go and move on to Peter Maurer's words on the issue. Again, he will be uh, on record video, recorded video. Uh, please start the video. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity for the International Committee of the Red Cross to bring our insights on humanitarian needs in conflict 
into this discussion. I commend the organizers of Expo 2020 Dubai for focusing on water as a major theme of this exhibition. I also commend the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation with present Switzerland to highlight water in the Swiss pavilion with this special day dedicated to the Blue Peace Initiative. Although water is a highly contested resource in armed conflicts, I believe that it is one of the handful of issues that can form the basis for cooperation and dialogue across borders, communities, sectors and generations. Today, I would like to address the challenges of access to water in conflict and how principled humanitarian action can be a building block for stability and trust building between parties that may foster the conditions for peace building. Importantly, humanitarian actors are not peace builders. Neutral, impartial, independent humanitarian action is distinct from political agendas and it must remain so. Yet, while others make peace, humanitarian action helps to make peace possible. Frontline humanitarian action is a vital stabilizing factor in fragmented environments and a building block towards stabilization. In many contexts, millions of people survive and can go back to previously stable lives because of sustained humanitarian upkeep of essential services, including water systems. Through our work in cities such as Aleppo, Benghazi, Gaza or Goma, and countries including Myanmar or South Sudan, the ICRC has become all too familiar with the severe and cumulative impacts on population when essential services are damaged in conflict. This is particularly fraught in urban conflicts where there is a real risk of widespread damage to critical civilian infrastructure. The humanitarian consequences are grim, from public health crisis, loss of livelihoods, displacements to environmental degradation. There is often no safe water to drink, no electricity to power water infrastructure or homes, nor health services to treat the sick. In protracted conflicts, children under five are 20 times more likely to die from diseases linked to unsafe water and sanitation than from violence. Preventing damage from occurring in the first place is paramount. Insufficient respect for applicable rules is the principal cause of suffering during armed conflicts. International humanitarian law clearly prohibits attacks on objects indispensable to the survival of civilian populations and must be respected. IHL also contains rules that protect the natural environment and that seek to limit the damage caused by armed conflict. The ICRC works with parties to conflict and those who influence them to share expertise and guidance on the practical implementation of international humanitarian law. The provision of clean and regular water supply is also a humanitarian priority for the ICRC. In overall 80 countries, our expert teams work to provide water for populations affected by conflict and violence. In 2021, we covered the urgent water needs of more than 37 million people with a workforce of 800 staff. Next year, our highly motivated water and habitat unit will celebrate 40 years. Over the decades, the unit has remained agile and innovative, continually updating its expertise and adapting its approaches in order to keep pace with the complexities of the humanitarian environment. Today, ICRC remains capable of delivering a high quality and sustainable response thanks to the expanded pool of experts and throughout our engagement and partnerships with local authorities, National Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, the private sector and academic circles. Today, our partnership with development actors include the World Bank, Agence Française de Développement and the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency. The ICRC is present during the long years of war when political solutions are absent because allowing critical infrastructure to fail is simply not an option. Substituting local authorities for decades with water trucking, quick fixes or providing medical equipment to clinics 
in remote basements is not sustainable. ICRC is therefore working to prevent critical infrastructure that is too big to fail from collapsing and forcing millions into deeper crisis. This requires repair and rehabilitation of infrastructure, providing parts, building resilience and contingency planning, as well as training and capacity building of local service providers. In doing so, we seek to mitigate humanitarian consequences, strengthen the resilience of essential services and stem the reversal of sustainable development goals. Our work requires a sound understanding of social and political dynamics in order to contribute to alleviating rather than exacerbating tensions. Access to water is not only influenced by the availability of water, but also by the equitable allocation of resources. We apply very carefully the do no harm approach every time we operate where there are divisions among groups, for example, among host communities and refugees, different ethnic groups and areas under different political or military control. In many places, including in the Middle East, understanding and responding to these diversities is an important part of principled and effective humanitarian response. Given our experience, the ICRC believes there is a real possibility that essential services can be used as an entry point to establish confidence-building measures in negotiations or as part of peace-building efforts. The benefits of successful negotiation that restores access to essential services are clear. However, it should not be underestimated how politicized governance issues around essential services and natural resources can be during times of armed conflict. Any engagement with the parties to a conflict with the aim of ensuring access to essential services like water should be informed by international humanitarian law and humanitarian principles. The ICRC operations often see us working across conflict lines as we re-establish essential services to all sides. Encouragingly, in several conflicts, opponents will cooperate on water when they will not cooperate on anything else, giving us the access and supply chains we need to keep the water flowing. We have seen sides in heavily contested battles, such as Syria, agree to keep the electricity and water supply largely available to the population. Right now, in eastern Ukraine, despite the tensions, the ICRC is in constant dialogue to support the water authorities of Voda Donbassa to ensure that 2.7 million people living in both sides of the contact line have access to water. In addressing the critical issue of access to water, the ICRC makes three asks to the international community. One, to respect international humanitarian law and take into account the interdependence of essential services and to mitigate the cumulative impacts of protracted conflict on civilian populations. Two, to facilitate critical dialogue on water needs between worrying parties. And three, to prioritize and support effective partnership across sectors to ensure water services are resilient to conflict and other hazards, including climate. Excellencies, colleagues. Water is essential for healthy and dignified lives. Water can be a catalyst for development and peace. A building block for these efforts is the stabilizing and trust-building influence of principled humanitarian action. I thank you. I would like to thank Peter Maurer from ICRC uh, for these also very powerful words. And uh, I would like to welcome Igor Malgrati, who is a representative of the ICRC here in the region, to compliment Peter Maurer with a few words. Please, Mr. Malgrati. Thanks. Excellencies, ladies and, uh, and gentlemen, I'm just uh, willing to uh, compliment uh, with a few words uh, with the angle of uh, the, the Middle East uh, perspective. The ICRC has been uh, uh, serving uh, people in regards with uh, water and, uh, and sanitation needs uh, from Syria to Yemen, 
from Egypt uh, to Iraq. The department which is dedicated uh, to that, and uh, as uh, the president of the ACRC said, uh, uh, next year will be 40 years uh, of, of anniversary, is the Water and Habitat Department, it, which is dedicated to assist conflict-affected population in regards uh, with uh, access to water and other essential services, like energy, wastewater, health. We work uh, in, uh, in most of the countries where uh, the, the conflict uh, is. I can mention uh, some uh, examples from Gaza, where we act as a neutral intermediary between uh, Israel and Palestinian uh, authorities in order to coordinate the movement of service providers during the hostilities. We work also in uh, Syria and Yemen following the humanitarian principle and working across uh, the front lines to serve those who most uh, need it. And also we work in, uh, in Lebanon, where probably the do no harm principle mentioned by the, the president is a bit more uh, evident, uh, where uh, host communities uh, and uh, refugees coexist, uh, where uh, there is a very fragmented uh, uh, society. And uh, a deep understanding on, of these dynamics, including the socio-political ones, is what uh, allows our operation to be effective and to go in the direction uh, that we believe is our angle as humanitarian, the direction of uh, start uh, putting the first block, uh, which allows uh, when uh, the situation will, uh, will uh, help uh, to build uh, peace. Many thanks. Many thanks, Mr. Malgratti, and uh, thanks to the ICRC. We are now with our third and final keynote before we go to a first break. Uh, it's my honor to invite Ambassador Dancy from the STC to have uh, words, her words on water, a catalyst for sustainable development and peace. Thank you very much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a pleasure for me to be here in, in Dubai. Uh, to be part of this launch of the month of water here from the Middle East. And uh, it's only the beginning of a month of very, very important issues that run up, the run up to the World Water Forum that will be held in Dakar at the end of March, uh, to which also our president, uh, Ignacio Cassis, will take part, where we can again and again stress the importance. Everything we bring here to the next level will be also discussed in other fora uh, this, this month. Now, water is a key factor for life and sustainable development. I think we all agree on that. We, the women of this world, know that a lot. Our sisters, our mothers, our daughters carry the water very, very long distances. We wash with it, we cook with it, we know how to feed the children with it and to replace the mother milk with water, clean water, how important it is that the children don't get sick. We know all that, and our place is also around the discussion of water. It's very important to include us in this discussion because we are the end users very much uh, when it comes to what to do with it. The scarcity puts peace and stability, um, of course, in peril. Already five years ago, 45 countries were listed as key when component to conflict was water. Water was also listed among the top five global risks for the nine, nine years passed on. Now, when we talk more about figures, we heard some, but I will add some more. Across the world, 153 countries share rivers, lakes, and aquifers. That is more than half of the land's surface. It's more than 60% of the global fresh water, and it's more than 40% of the world's population. Half of it, of course, are the women. When it's depleted, transboundary water supplies have the potential to cause social unrest, and sometimes much worse. Therefore, transboundary water cooperation is indispensable. We heard that many times now. We need it for sustainable development, for peace, 
and we need it also because it's lacking. Two thirds of the countries uh, where transboundary water management is needed, they don't have this as of now. Access to safe drinking water and decent sanitation are human rights. They're part of the Sustainable Development Goal agenda. Sustainable Development Goal number six is, of course, related to many other sustainable goals out of the 17. It's closely related to the ones of health and education. So this one, we heard, is dragging behind. And we, the community that is sitting here, can do something to catch up. The combination, I call it the deadly alliance of climate change and scarcity of water, the increasing population and the economic growth puts additional pressure on water. Switzerland has a long-standing experience in transboundary water cooperation. As an example, the Rhine. Many, many of you may not know what the Rhine is. The Rhine, we're very proud of it, is a long river that uh, the source is in the Swiss Alps and it finally ends in the North Sea. The Rhine um, had, was issued uh, cooperation agreements, transboundary cooperation agreements on the Rhine management, water management, are as old as 1950. So it is something that we have known and that we have seen how important it is. Last year, we had floods in Europe, very terrible floods, a lot of rain, and it was only thanks to the legal and operational arrangements of this Rhine water agreement that Switzerland actually, which is on top of the, of the Rhine, an upstream country, we released ahead of the bad weather conditions, we released water coordinated with our neighbors into the Rhine so that the lakes in the Alps had the capacity to absorb more water. This was only, only possible because we announced it regularly and because agreements were there before the catastrophe actually happened. Switzerland has started sharing good practice, as you see and hear. In 2010, my country officially launched the Blue Peace uh, Initiative. In essence, this initiative seeks to promote water cooperation across national borders, sectors and generations to foster peace, stability and sustainable development. Blue Peace combines water or hydro diplomacy with technical expertise on the ground support. Through these efforts, Switzerland acts as a mediator in transboundary water resource management. It can be viewed as an investment in peace. It's an investment also into human rights, and it's an investment that pays off over time. Today, Switzerland Blue Peace Initiative embraces a large-scale water diplomacy and multi-country development programs, mainly, but not exclusively, here in the Middle East, in Central Asia, and in West Africa. Let me give you some insight on the Middle East Blue Peace Initiative. Since I'm born, the Middle East has lost two thirds of its fresh water resources, two thirds. I'm not that old, um, so two thirds is a lot in a lifetime. Now, only this is a reason for alarm. And it was a foresight of the strategic foresight group, the Swedish Development Corporation, and His Royal Highness, Prince Al Hassan bin Talal, which we heard earlier speak, was a co-founder of the Blue Peace Middle East Initiative, because they recognized that this cannot go on like this, because if not, our great-grandchildren will not have any water left. Very important, these initiatives need to be owned locally. So since 2018, the Blue Peace Middle East Initiative is owned and driven by regional stakeholders. It includes regionally owned water cooperation mechanisms, a platform where the countries meet regularly to discuss issues that are important to them. And it's a first in the modern history of the entire region. As of January 2019, Blue Peace Middle East is led by the collective leadership from Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, and to some extent Syria. 
Currently, a particular focus lies on increasing water use efficiency in agriculture, because we also have to feed uh, with water. Uh, and it is important to use water when you grow, but how do you use it? Now, important is also the data collection, the exchange, and the policy briefings. Another focus has been on the elaboration of basic information and data, as was done for the Yarmouk River during the negotiations between Jordan and Syria on transboundary management of water resources. We need to know what we measure. We need to have data. You may wonder what 12 years since 2010, what kind of lessons did we learn? I would like to give you five that I believe are important to take on. First, it sounds obvious, but we, it's important to remind ourselves that dealing with water across borders is hardly ever only about water. It's about multiple socially, economically, politically, and culturally linked issues and we have to understand them. Why is water important for this community and for the other, beyond the just basic needs it entails? Second, processes around water and peace are slow. It takes time, perseverance, and patience are key and crucial. This also goes for funding. Third, trust. We cannot talk about water and water management if trust, confidence, and transparency is lacking. We need that. And it needs to be built if it's not there. Then fourth, data are key. We need to measure what we are talking about, that we can also hold people accountable. And fifth, shared benefits need to be celebrated more than they are today. We have to give upstream countries the benefit for contributing to water management of the downstream countries, and we have to celebrate this more often. Obviously, there is no one-size-fits-all solution, and we only can be good if we work in partnerships with this. What can Switzerland offer? Of course, we have lakes, the ambassador swam in those, and we have uh, mountains that hold uh, big resources. Switzerland is an honest broker, free from wider geopo geopolitics. Um, we can play an intermediary role between upstream and downstream countries. We are also an agile, innovative, predictable, and flexible donor that have a long-term vision when we engage. We have a know-how that we can share and that we are willing to share this includes processes, but it also we can come back to an ecosystem of academia, civil society, private sector stakeholders, international organizations that are all working towards the same goal. So in short, our engagement with many of you here will continue on blue peas and water management. We will be on this for a very long time because it will stick with us for long. Thank you very much that you're here today to talk about this. Enjoy the discussions and the evening with us. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Ambassador Dancy. Uh, and we have arrived now at the end of this first part. It was an excellent overview of the issue of water as a catalyst for peace and sustainable development. Keep your burning questions, which should not be a problem with this temperature here. For the panel discussion, towards the end, there will be a, 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 windows, a window for joint discussion and questions and comments from the audience. So please keep them for then. But now we would move on to a full half hour break um, for a coffee, a cool drink, or just plain water for you to digest, but also for discuss and chat with your fellow participants. For those who really need to cool off physically, uh, there, is, uh, an, uh, there is a room here which is air conditioned. So please also uh, feel free to go in there for uh, 10 minutes, half an hour. We will start in about 30 minutes again, and it will be announced by a Swiss cowbell. So um, I'm sure everybody will recognize a cowbell um, when we will be back for the panel discussion. 
uh, with the panelists, with the keynote speakers, and also with three um, additional panelists. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the keynote speakers. And please enjoy your coffee and your drink. Many thanks. Have you back in a half an hour.
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back and welcome to this second part, the panel discussion of this session on water as a catalyst for peace and sustainable development. I would like to announce now three panelists and the keynote speakers. The panelists will be from Iraq. Dr. Louis Ali Hussein, Senior Political Advisor of the Department of International Water Studies at the Iraqi Ministry of Water Resources. He's a specialist in transboundary water management cooperation and a member of the Policy Advisory Committee of the Blue Peace Middle East. From the Turkey, the member from the Turkey was not able to make it this is why we have invited his proxy, Professor Dr. Ahmed Miti Saji. Professor Saji is a very experienced and knowledgeable expert, a member of the Management Committee for the Blue Peace Middle East Regional Mechanism. He currently serves as the president of the Turkish Water Institute, Suan. And finally, we have from Lebanon, also a member of the Policy Advisory Committee of the Blue Peace Middle East Regional Mechanism, Dr. Gadas Khoury. Dr. Khoury was former Minister of Culture in the Lebanese government and served as an assistant to the former Prime Minister, Sahad Hariri. I would like to welcome these three um, gentlemen and I would also welcome the three keynote speakers, Patricia Dancy, Ambassador Dancy, Dr. Danilo Turk and also Igor Malgrati from the ICRC to come forward to the panel here. Please come to the stage. So, many thanks for joining this panel discussion. And I would like to start with the Middle East. The Middle East is warming twice as fast as the global average. There is also compelling evidence that it will be the Middle East region that climate change will hit hardest. We have heard a lot about how water can become a catalyst for sustainable development and peace and about the challenges to this respect. I would like to start with Dr. Saji. Dr. Saji, what are the current issues in your country and in the region? What is your country facing related to water security and how could increased transboundary cooperation help on these issues? I start with introductory questions to all of you for then to move on to a more interactive discussion. Dr. Saji. Thank you. Is it working? Or it is working. working. All right. Well, the issues of water security in Turkey, I can, I can classify them in maybe in four items. Um, the first item is the population increase. We are 82 million, and we have accepted four million refugees, which is addition to water demand. And of course, as the population increases, the water uh, we have is limited. And um, if it is less than, as you know, 1,000 cubic meters per person per year, you are a water deficient country. Right now, we are 1,000, like 300 uh, something. So in the year 2050, we will drop down to 1,200 cubic meters per person per year. And this is, uh, that means as population increases, we'll be a water deficient country. You know, unlike most, most people think we are water rich country. And uh, the climate change is the second factor which most of the speakers uh, mentioned. Um, 
it shows that we will have, especially in the southern parts of Turkey, southeast, the climate change models say we will have a 15 to 25 percent decrease in precipitation. And we will have 20 percent increase in the northern part of Turkey, and it means floods and etc. So we have this uh, climate issue, which is, which, is, which is there. We have a precipitation of like 330 millimeters average, but it changes. You know, it's not a uniform system all throughout Turkey, and this will affect on the transboundary waters as well. So um, the refugees is, is another issue, climate change is another, another issue will be um, where we spend the water. We, we spent 75% in agriculture, and we have to increase our efficiency in agriculture. We have to stop using, let's say, 10,000 or 15,000 uh, cubic meters per hectare per year we should maybe half it. And these are the main uh, issues that we are facing. And I think your next question was how transboundary cooperation can help that. Exactly. Uh, there, there is no other solution. When climate change uh, decreases the precipitation, uh, the only solution is you have to cooperate so that all parties, they understand each other. For example, uh, when we come to Euphrates and Tigris, uh, they are uh, waters which are uh, snow melt waters. The snow in the uh, southeast of Turkey, they, it melts. And due to climate change, now it's melting one month earlier. So it has effects. And we, we, we have decrease in the Euphrates water levels as well. But we have to share this. I think my time is up already. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Zarchi. Okay. Euphrates and Tigris is the key word for our next panelist, Dr. Ali Hussein. Iraq is the country of Tigris and Euphrat. What are the issues of water in your country? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the most ar uh, urgent uh, challenge uh, faces Iraq. Uh, Could you please hold your mic a bit closer? Closer? That's yeah. good. Okay. Uh, the most urgent uh, challenge facing Iraq in uh, water uh, security can be summarized as uh, uh, the first one and most important is uh, that stabilizing Iraqi water wouldn't be guaranteed without uh, concrete agreement or arrangement for uh, allocating uh, equitably water with the core appearance states. And another challenge is the, and this recently, is combined the, uh, unstable uh, uh, region and uh, an unstable situation with the climate change of course it uh, have influence on the region in general but uh, as the downstream Iraq is more affected by these factors uh, third one is what happened uh, last uh, 10 years Iraq was working hardly to develop its uh, water infrastructure, but the turning point was after uh, 2014, when a uh, terrorist group of ISIS destroyed, sabotaged and destroyed many inf water infrastructure in the country. That represented uh, uh, pr for Iraq to 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 war uh, to make huge efforts and uh, large uh, finance commitment to rehabilitate uh, the, this uh, infrastructure. The second uh, question was uh, how transboundary water cooperation help? Uh, uh, I think uh, Iraq was constantly uh, uh, urging that it is never European states to cooperate uh, and uh, to share the benefits of the river. Not only the benefits, actually, also the uh, bear the harm uh, collectively. Uh, the, and to put it in other words, Iraq believes that cooperation is win-win approach. Thank you. Many thanks. We move on to the Lebanon, which is faced with particular challenges these days. Um, 
migration. Dr. Kauri, what is the water issue in your country and what is the meaning of water cooperation, transboundary water cooperation in the Lebanon? Well, uh, to tell you frankly, uh, basically the uh, trans transboundary uh, water uh, cooperation, uh, we only have uh, three rivers that cross from, one, uh, from Lebanon to other countries. One of them is the uh, al Asi River between us and Syria, but we have an agreement to that. And there is two other rivers that cross uh, to Palestine. And these are difficult problems now because of the political situation between uh, Lebanon and Israel. Uh, the other issues that we have is that uh, such a small country with so much reserves, should be so much reserves of water. We have a lot of snows on the mountains. Uh, we have not been very successful in preserving the water that we have. Uh, the lakes and uh, dams that have been built were not very efficient. And the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, river in Lebanon, which is the Litani River, has been struck with contamination, is terrible chemical and biological contamination that is a real problem. On top of that, uh, Lebanon is a four million uh, inhabitants country. Now we have two million refugees. And most of these refugees, not only that they are necessitating more water, and uh, of obviously the sewage also is under stress, but they are also settling near river, uh, ed, uh, river banks. And this will also produce more contamination to these rivers. So it is a complex situation. On top of everything else, we have a, an economic collapse, which is not helping uh, neither uh, to help the measures that the government has, uh, you know, uh, uh, has had but cannot enforce now because of the uh, economic situation and the, uh, you know, the sanitary, uh, 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 the sanitary settlements that have been uh, in force has not been working at all. And this is creating a, a real problem uh, for Lebanon. The agriculture takes a lot of uh, the water in Lebanon, but unfortunately now, it's not only that it's taking a lot of uh, the water, it's also contaminated water. Thank you very much. Two million migrants out of a population of four millions and we know where most of these migrants come from. Ms. Malgrati, in 2017 alone, 45 conflicts on this planet were associated with water, where water was a conflict. What does the ICRC experience, the how does the ICRC experience the link between water scarcity and conflict in its daily operations? in general, but particularly also in the region? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the, the question, Simon. Uh, I think that it's important to uh, uh, focus a bit on uh, how the modern conflicts, uh, modern armed conflicts are. And uh, there are three features uh, that uh, are important to, uh, uh, to list. The first one is, uh, is the scale. Uh, the scale, and especially in the Middle East, this is the case, uh, it's quite important. It, it takes uh, a very often uh, parts of a country or even more than a country. It takes uh, urban uh, settlements, which means uh, very often uh, millions of people. And uh, modern conflict also uh, scatter uh, uh, all around uh, a, a quite important number of people as displaced. This is the first feature. The second one it's, uh, it's about the duration. Uh, modern uh, conflict uh, has a clear uh, start date, but they don't, uh, it's not clear when they end. That's why we always uh, uh, call them protracted armed conflict. Uh, and uh, for example, the five, five uh, biggest uh, operations where the ICRC is uh, globally, it's been there for uh, more than 45 uh, years, just to give you a bit the, the idea of, uh, of the duration. Uh, the last uh, is the, the complexity. So there is a, an amount of uh, armed groups, uh, there is a, a, an incredible uh, number of uh, stakeholders uh, to be considered, and uh, very important, uh, since uh, it happens in, uh, in, in urban settlements, uh, 
urban settlements are quite a complex uh, environment. There are the services, there are markets, and when, and this is a bit the second part of your question uh, in terms of water, when it comes to uh, water services uh, in urban settlements, those are uh, very much uh, interconnected with energy, wastewater. Uh, so you can imagine when uh, war erupts in, uh, in an urban area, how complex uh, is uh, to deal uh, with, uh, with that. There are uh, really many kind uh, how of, of, um, of ways uh, how the, the, the conflict can impact on, uh, on water services. It can be direct when, uh, for example, uh, uh, part of the infrastructure can be targeted. And this happens uh, more and more, uh, as uh, Dr. Turk uh, explained in his uh, speech. It can be indirect, uh, notably with the brain drain. Uh, the environment of an armed conflict is quite uh, um, said people leaves the country and uh, and very often uh, capacities uh, flies out you can imagine if a water service provider loses his best stuff uh, how can uh, can be done and finally there is a cumulative impact uh, direct and indirect uh, accumulate uh, together uh, creating a situation that very uh, very hard to uh, to recover from and this has uh, dire humanitarian uh, consequences, uh, which um, leads to my uh, last, uh, last part. The humanitarian consequences we, we deal with, we face with in, uh, in the Middle East uh, are, are various, increased uh, um, competition over a, a resource, water, which is already quite, uh, quite scarce, uh, a hindered, um, in their economy, uh, loss of livelihoods, uh, displacement. This is something that we face every day, and it's uh, definitely related to water. But my message is that, yes, there is a risk of uh, further competition over water. Uh, there is a risk of uh, conflict, but on the other side, there is also a risk of cooperation, and, uh, and we see it. Uh, that uh, doesn't matter if it's scarce, it, it's not necessarily leading to uh, uh, to social grievance, uh, to conflict. Uh, cooperation is a way uh, there. Many thanks, uh, Igor Malgrati. Um, complexity, uh, an issue. You also mentioned the attacks on water-related infrastructure. Danilo Turk, uh, you've been the chairman of the Global High-Level Panel on Water and Peace, which published in 2017 this report we have already cited, a matter of survival. And within there were a number of recommendations. One was called the drama of water. And it was said that water scarcity and deteriorating quality uh, represents a never more pronounced conflict risk multiplier. And one call in this report was also that the UN Assembly, General Assembly should embrace or should launch new policy. Particularly, the UN Security Council was expected to develop a policy for the protection of water resources and installations in armed conflicts. Where do we stand today in that endeavor? Thank you. <clears throat> well, first of all, I would like to explain that the Global High Level Panel on Water and Peace was convened in order to explain to the world that water is also a political problem. Because people usually talk about water as a problem for experts, for hydrologists, for hydrogeologists, for water engineers, and for others. And often the political class likes to delegate water issues to experts without taking the necessary level of political responsibility and particularly not sufficiently early. So that was the reason why that panel was brought together and why we chose such a dramatic title, A Matter of Survival. Now that report came out five years ago. And since that, things actually worsened everywhere in the world. And when you ask me specifically about the United Nations, I can say the following. Our report came out in 2017. There were more UN reports coming at about that time independently of us, and one on water disasters, the other on water management. And altogether, that has helped the General Assembly to put together something that is called Water Action Decade, International Water Action Decade. 
next year in 2023, the UN will hold a medium term conference of the decade. And that would be the closest to what we have proposed in 2017. The world should come together and try to find a way forward globally. Now, of course, in the meantime, the effects of the climate change have become more serious. The political problems of the world have worsened and made international cooperation more difficult and have almost paralyzed the United Nations Security Council. And we have not seen enough progress in the Security Council. I understand that Switzerland will join the Security Council next year. And that will be an opportunity to move this higher on the agenda of the Council. And Slovenia may join a year later. And so there will be some non-permanent members who would be prepared to to work in that direction. So the Security Council is one thing, the General Assembly is another, but most importantly, I think the world has to understand that the problems are now becoming such that politicians must not be allowed to delegate their decisions to a technical level. This should be understood as a matter requiring political vision and responsibility. And that should include high-level diplomacy as well. For example, the UN Secretary General could do things on water in different specific circumstances involving heads of state, the top level of politicians. That should not be seen as something impossible or something too technical. Secondly, the United Nations and the world will have to figure out how to energize the Sustainable Development Goals, which were started in 2015 with a lot of hope, but it is clear now that they are lagging behind everywhere. So there is a need to re-energize the whole process. And the question is, where does water stand in that context? Again, this is not a question only for water specialists. They, of course, will have to make their contribution, and they are making that contribution. They do provide data about the growing problems of lower precipitation and um, higher evaporation on earlier melting of glaciers and all that things. I mean, that is there. The question is how to translate the knowledge and the warning that already exists into political understanding and political action. And here, I think, we'll have the opportunities in the coming years to do something and obviously, our discussion today can perhaps go a little further in, in figuring out what exactly to do. Many thanks, Danilo Turk. International cooperation, diplomacy, political will. Ambassador Donsi, Switzerland has supported the agenda of water and peace for more than a decade now. We, in, in your keynote, you have shared uh, a series of insights and together with 14 other countries, Switzerland had been, has been co-convening of the mentioned uh, high-level report on water and peace. In short, Switzerland has been quite active in the past. How does the future, how is the future uh, of Switzerland, the Swiss engagement on the water and peace agenda? How does it look like? I think one of the one of the things that I take with me that the people that spoke before me have mentioned is we have to realize that there is no way back and we all have to make sure that we get this degree of urgency on the matter that was already put on your report in 2015 and if it's not urgent why should people move and we see all the changes that happened. Uh, I also heard here in the Emirates what happened when you realized that the water was not enough. What happened then? And I think we have to bring this degree of urgency to people, to governments, to force political decisions. I said that this morning and I repeated this afternoon. The, we are collectively, we have the intelligence to do this. We have the intelligence to put partnerships together. We have proven it during the COVID crisis, which no one foreseen, which was urgent, and where we have managed to put academia, international organizations, public, private, together to solve this. So that is one, one angle. And then, of course, it needs the will and also the recognition that people will move where there is water. We have today 
almost as many climate refugees than we have refugees of internal and international conflicts. So this will increase. It is not a matter of will it or will it not. It will. People will move where the water is. And countries like uh, Turkey, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, they will have more people coming because they have the water today. Maybe all of them will move further on uh, in 100 years or 200, but we will be we will be facing a different, a different, a different world, and prevention is also one of the issues that we will have to take seriously to prepare for what is the new normal. We cannot go back. The glaciers will be melted, and we cannot reproduce them just like this. Many, many thanks. Um, keyword urgency. Keyword political will. Uh, as as not to delegate it to the expert level. Um, now we would like to open this uh, discussion here, and uh, I would invite you just to take a microphone and contribute, but to start again, Dr. Saatchi, in this region, which will be hit hardest, or already is hit hardest by climate change, how do we bring, how can we trigger political will so that water issues are not just delegated to expert level? Well, uh, that's <laughs> the uh, key question, actually. I also attend European Environment uh, Agency Scientific Committee. We have been discussing for years the science policy interface, which I'm trying to understand as I, as I work into the... Uh, as Danila Turk has said, uh, what we have is uh, we cannot, the scientists, uh, cannot um, transfer their ideas correctly to policymakers. And the policymakers, they don't know how to ask the right questions, unfortunately. So we have a dilemma there, and we have to solve it one way or the other. The, the only way is to have meetings, to have contacts, and publications maybe. And it differs from country to country. For example, we have seen for Jordan, it's very simple because the prince is there. But in other countries, it's, it's kind of difficult to reach to the policymakers, the real policymakers. If, if that's okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What can the policy advisory committee and the regional mechanism provide here? To me again? To you or to, to any other panel members as well? Please, please go ahead. Take. Uh, actually, this is uh, uh, talking about uh, the bridge between uh, creating this, uh, creating this bridge between the uh, political uh, to technical issue to into to uh, political side. Is Need to take the mic. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it is one uh, big issue. We we always discuss this. Uh, depends on the political system, on the country. Each country has these conditions in general. Uh, but still, there is uh, there is possibility to bring. Uh, I mean, like for example, these uh, conferences and the meetings always uh, somehow will reach the message what what technical technicians want to convey to politicians. I mean, this is one one way. But, uh, of course, it needs more and more. That's very difficult way how to think and how, how to reach this uh, point. Dr. Kauri, how would you I try to get <coughs> political buy-in? I think uh, there is two main issues. First of all, the awareness. People should be aware about our problems, about the water problem. And this needs the media also to be aware of this, and we should be working with the media hand in hand to reflect on the gravity of the situation. And then there is the will to change. The will to change is a political will that will change things. No matter how uh, we do, at the end of the day, the decision is in the hands of the politicians. 
the will will come if we lobby for it, and if we make the media also lobby with us, uh, the politicians are always interested in that the media reflects their good side of the story. So, uh, so it is awareness and a, uh, the, uh, the will to change are the most important thing. Maybe, maybe if you allow, um, I think politicians are in, in most countries, not in all, but elected by the people. So the, they are also very worried what their constituency says. And I can say in many of the countries where young people went to the street every Friday to demonstrate for climate, this had a political impact on, on many leaders and many parties. And so that became somehow mainstream. You see, climate today is mainstream. No one is against it. And it has been forced on the ones that were by the people that were asking for more of this. And with water, it could be similar. You can also switch it off uh, easily and uh, force people to go to the public well and dig it. Then you would bring some urgency. That would be an extreme measure. But I think to make sh people available of the scarcity has not yet happened. It's still, we can still shower for 20 minutes, even in Dubai. No one will shut off the shower for us or, or, or bring us uh, into an alarm bell. We will have to make sure people, ordinary people, are aware of the scarcity. Thank you, Ambassador Dancy. You said we need to have the people on board. And uh, Danilo Turk, you mentioned, you said in your keynote this morning, the Blue Peace Movement instead of the initiative. How, what did you mean by movement? Yeah. Uh, look, I, I in fact had a very specific recent experience in mind. Well, of course, I'm coming from Slovenia, which is a water-rich country, but it is not problem-free. I mean, problems of water appear everywhere. They are different, they are more dramatic, less dramatic, but they are everywhere. Last year in Slovenia, we had a situation when the government proposed a new law which would allow new types of construction on waterfronts, and that would have a problematic impact on rivers and lakes in the country. And all of a sudden, young people rose and, and organized the referendum. Actually, they initiated the referendum, they obtained the referendum, and they convinced their parents to vote against that law. And therefore, that law was withdrawn from the parliament. And that came not as a result of um, technical expertise or any policy-driven um, initiative. It came as a result of genuine human concern. And what we have seen then was a movement. And that movement was really something that touched every person. I mean, uh, my wife and I, my wife is here, she can confirm that I'm really <laughs> telling you the truth. I mean, we were actually asked by our daughter and by young people, look, when are you going to sign the request for the referendum? So we went, and at the, at the booth, uh, when they were collecting the signatures, they were all young people. And they would say, you have to hear our request. We don't want that law because that will have a long-lasting effect and it will be bad. And everybody followed. So we have opportunities for, you know, harnessing a movement. Now, of course, I, I'm not naive. I know that there are different countries and there are different levels of awareness. There are different opportunities or lack of opportunities for young people. And we have to understand that too. But the problem is something that we all share. And I think sometimes it is quite necessary to be blunt and ask political leaders at different levels very directly and, and in a very challenging manner. And that goes to all levels, not only to, to regional or national level, also to international level. Now, we'll see in a month from now a conference called World Water Forum in Dakar, in Senegal. Many leaders will be there, in particular African leaders, and I think they should be challenged there very visibly, very openly, on the question of transboundary water cooperation as a vital necessity. 
There will be United Nations fora. The Secretary General should be challenged. What are you doing? Are you, you know, you have a telephone in your office. Do you call this or that head of state? And if not, why not? So, look, I mean, what I'm saying is there is a potential there. It's only necessary to move from a, from a, from a situation where people generally perceived water issues as technical into a situation where people will understand the deeply existential and therefore political nature of the problem of water. And that must be done in a variety of ways. And the common name for all this is Blue Peace Movement. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it, it needs to take these people, right, to raise the issues, to be brought to politicians. Um, but how do we, how can we use this momentum also for the issue of transboundary water management? You cited the, the, the example of Slovenia, which is a, was a national issue. How do we also trigger or do we motivate people to raise this beyond their own borders. Maybe Dr. Sachi can have another <laughs> view on that and also in view of the uh, World right. Water Forum. Yes, I work for the Bureau of the World Water Forum. But you ask me the most difficult questions. Right? Sure, that's, that's uh, right. You're the professor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for transboundary cooperation to make the politicians aware of the problems, we have a method that we are uh, working on. We make an action plan. And we say, OK, between these two countries, we will have um, integrated water resource management in the specific areas. And uh, we will have, for example, uh, irrigation uh, efficiencies in these areas. And we publish it. And we try to make the politicians accept it as a result, and we put a timetable for it. So that's a method that we are trying. I'm not saying that it's very successful, but as uh, you have said in your, uh, in your speech, this transboundary cooperation is a slow process. It takes time, it takes um, capacity building, trust building, which is very difficult. Well, now that Dr. Sachi spoke first, and he's always the one who, who, who receives the most difficult questions, yes, so yes. I think we have to <laughs> defer to him, but we also have to help him. Obviously, there are different situations in different uh, transboundary regions. I mean, you cannot have one formula that will work everywhere. And obviously, Dr. Sachi explained something that, uh, in his experience, works in the region he knows and where he works. Now, there are other regions where, for example, politicians should understand that transboundary water cooperation can be something that is sold to the people as success. That, in fact, by developing transboundary cooperation, you demonstrate political leadership. That may not work in all circumstances, but it does work in some circumstances. Now, of course, the uh, Senegal River Corporation is a very good example of that, and that's a unique example. I don't think that it can be copied anywhere else. But we have seen variations of this in Europe as well. I remember the situations where uh, politicians came before the cameras and said, well, you know, we exercise our leadership by signing, for example, in our part of the world, the um, Sava River Agreement, which is about uh, a river in the areas of countries of former Yugoslavia, uh, in Central Europe on Danube and so forth. Politicians were sometimes able to sell their leadership as success to, their, to, their, to the people on whom they depend. And the third one, which is actually quite uh, important, is international financing. International financing. If there is internationally provided money for, for a transboundary operation, being it fully understood that that's a long-term thing, that the risks have to be addressed very carefully, financial risks included, and that it is a low-yield uh, project, I mean, because none of them is highly profitable, like uh, production of pharmaceuticals or anything, uh, then obviously that can be a, a, an extremely powerful tool for politi political leaders 
to exercise leadership. Because if they can say to their constituencies, hey, we have internationally financed project that will benefit the people, that can be a good uh, element of leadership. Thank you. Can I, yeah. can I compliment some? Sure, please. I, I, would, I would totally agree that uh, there's no one size that fits to all. Uh, even, you know, like in Europe, the transboundary water means uh, navigational use of waters. Even the name of the 97 convention, non-navigational, which I don't understand. Because for Middle East, water, Mitra, please. water for Middle East, the water is food. It's much more urgent. It's much more important. So they are totally different things. Thank you. Dr. Ali Hussein, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I agree. Every basin has its own conditions and uh, uh, atmosphere. That is, some some basins uh, uh, has two, three European states, and another more than like Niles, more more than eleven uh, eleven states. Uh, but uh, I, if I would be asking, uh, there is long term maybe maybe would be the knowledge constructing knowledge will pave the way for cooperation in long term, at least. This is my, our experience as uh, downstream states to, to uh, tra Tigris and Euphrates rivers and more than seasonal uh, and non-seasonal, uh, more than 44 uh, seasonal and non-seasonal uh, rivers originate from Iran. Knowledge, constructing knowledge would, would pave the way for uh, cooperation. Many thanks. I would now move on to a final window of opportunity. There is certainly a lot of knowledge out here uh, within or among the audience. And I would like to invite you now, um, if you have questions, comments, or contributions, to share your views and thoughts on what had been said. There were different keywords, complexity, we need people to move, movement. There is knowledge needed and political will. We have seen a lot of facets of the complex issue of transboundary water management. If you have a thought or you want to share idea, please raise your hand and there will be people who will bring the micro. Please. We have uh, Mark Saitun, director the of the Chidi Water Hub. Please. Thank you, Simone, and thank you for organizing the panel. And thanks to the panel for mapping it out so well. It is a complex issue. And what I retain from it are the political, economic, but also ideological challenges that uh, um, Patricia Dunsey mentioned. I'd just like to, and to continue maybe to tie it down a little bit further, I wonder if we could do a thought exercise. Uh, and assuming that you know politics is a problem and political will is an issue, the economics isn't there, or the economics is driving over water use, and nationalism like hoarding water or um, using it solely for capital goods or solely as a commodity. With all that in mind, I wonder if we could begin to identify the obstacles. So the thought experiment would be, so for Miss, Miss Danzi, you have to spend $500 billion a year. Where exactly would you put that money? In which sectors and specifically which sorts of initiatives to create this movement or for whatever goal you have? And Dr. Danilo, if you're president of the world, so infinitely more powerful than the UN Secretary General, what would you put in place? And I'll leave the, any, anybody else who wants to take the question would be more than welcome. Many thanks. <laughs> I think it would, we would right go to the reactions. Um, Patricia, don't see. You, or, <laughs> it's too she, difficult. And, uh, you can hand out. You can hand over to uh, Danilo Turk. You're the vice president. Okay, I, I uh, take the floor because before the, the president of the world, <laughs> if I had 500 times or 200 times the budget that we have, 
I don't think I would all use it because if you have less resources, you become more innovative. And for a scarcity problem and the water problem, we need people to think out of need. Uh, and I think there I would spend 1% of it and hold the rest back, banked on a Swiss bank, and um, wait what happened for wait what happens for one year and uh, get the innovative ideas that spring out of it and then multiply it with the 499 billion that remain. Dr. Danilo Turk, as a president of the world. Well, look, in that capacity, I'm very grateful to <laughs> Ambassador Dancy for having, <clears throat> for having suggested a way uh, which could actually be made universal if one wanted really to be globally serious about water issues. But before, <clears throat> before trying to use my imagination a little bit, which I think is allowed, is, is, um, is actually acceptable in this panel, I would like to explain uh, to my friend Dr. Sachi the following about non-navigational uses of water. You see, in Europe, obviously, several hundred years of history of water cooperation started with navigation. That was the original reason for international codification. And non-navigational uses came later, mainly energy generation, agricultural use, and subsequently then uh, environmental protection and all that. Now, of course, we live in a very different world everywhere, including in Europe. So navigational uses are much less important, and all the others are much more important which again is another illustration of complexity of water issues and the need to figure out the new ways. And therefore, we are grateful to Ambassador Danzig, who just showed us how, how these things could be done. Now, uh, coming back to the dreamy idea about the, what the president of the world would do. Look, <laughs> three things, I believe. First, if you want to achieve something at whatever level you work, you need to have a plan. In the United Nations, there are 32 elements, programs, funds, uh, agencies, which are dealing with water. But none of them has water as priority number one. You will have water in FAO, in Food and Agriculture, in, in UNESCO, here and there, in everywhere. But n nobody has water as, prim is, as priority number one. So I would say, look, people get together and work a water plan for the world. Because there is a lot of knowledge already, there is a lot of good ideas around, a lot of um, uh, excellent technical expertise. Use all that and come with a plan. There is a proposal right now to have um, a UN uh, special representative for water who may perhaps try to do something of that sort. Secondly, I would go to the financial institutions and say we need a completely new approach innovative approach to water financing. Uh, and that approach, of course, would require a great deal of financial prudence. We understand that. But there are proposals already for what is uh, called the safe space dialogues. You, you have to bring people, once they approach to the decision-making point, to a closed place without any uh, interference of public debate, simply to analyze the risks very carefully and to chart the way towards an agreement on financing that will stick, that will not neglect or ignore existing risks and will not be illusionary in the sense of expecting quick uh, returns or high, unnecessarily high returns. So, so that's the financial part. And then the third part would be diplomatic. I mean, it, it's absolutely necessary for the high-level diplomacy to, a, to enter the picture. It is not in the picture right now. There is much diplomacy at lower levels, but you need to have all levels involved. And there has to be an involvement of heads of state, and of course, uh, you know, a president of the world would have an easy job to do. But we don't have such a president, and we are not, not likely to have one for next 50 to 100 years, so let's not uh, hope for that. But there are others who can, who can move the high-level diplomacy, and that would be stage number three. Thank you very much. Be assured, if you run for presidency of the world, we would elect you. 
there was a, a woman just behind Mark Seaton who has raised her hand. Please, yeah, ask thank your you. question. I'm, I'm Aysun Azabi from Jordan. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Swiss government because they are supporting Blue Peace. I'm with them starting since 2009. It was a great uh, initiative that uh, I was involved in. But uh, what you said, all of you, is uh, time, trust, awareness. This is what we're doing here in Jordan and there. But I think we need to be back up with legal, strong legal framework. Like in Jordan, even with Wadi Araba Agreement, it says in the Wadi Araba Agreement both they have to look for new resources of water and we end up buying water. It's our rights. We need somebody to come. We, we built the Unity Dam. It's from our money we sign uh, with Syria. And uh, then based on this investment, we have this dam, but nobody follow or commit binding from all the commitments. So we need, uh, like with Lebanon, they, they have a right in Jordan River, they have in Orantis. Um, they don't have to sign a peace with the country that taking its water. Why not to have another solution uh, with uh, maybe with third party? They have a right in Jordan River, but they are not there to negotiate because they don't, they don't have a peace a treaty. For this, is, I think it is important to work hard with the international water law, with the new type of agreement. What we have is not enough, and it proves it's not the right mechanism. We have Wadi Araba, we have something with Syria. I don't know what Iraqi and uh, they have with Turkey. Uh, even with the Blue Peace, we managed to convey, and you know, Mr. Daniel, we, we, we tried to promote, to tell um, uh, that uh, using water is one of the mass destruction. Because when you have ISIL, the first thing that they did, they conquer Tabaqa Dam in Syria. They know it's a good weapon. We tried to have a um, decision or resolution from uh, the UN, United Nations says you, ju you shouldn't come near this because water is important. For the idea, and we are there, we're, we're happy to, to join project to research, but we need to have a legal international backup can help me if I need, if Syria the abolish or they didn't do what I, uh, what we agreed upon. We need to have international court, even there is no international court where we can go there and said we spent hundred millions and uh, look at the dam, it is uh, empty. We have, uh, even with Wadi Araba at Yarmouk, Israel also, they, they're building dams, uh, like uh, Jordanian as well, they have also illegal wells. We need somebody, even if I want, if Syria or Turkey or whoever want to make any infrastructure, they, they should be forced to consult rather than in, in the well, um, good well, trust, it takes time, but there is, Conflict of interest, yani why should Turkey give us water without taking it just in no because they trust us. The problem it is not the trust, it is they compete on a source that vital. He said, Mr. Sachi, you know, they reach the poverty line. They don't have that much water. Why should he give water? Nobody from the international community forced him to do this. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is a question that is diverted to Puck to a PAC member panelist. Uh, I would ask you again, one of the PAC members first, and then to elaborate on the law side, maybe uh, Danilo Turk again, but well, please the PAC member. First. Again, difficult questions, but um, <laughs> I think this transboundary water issue and the negotiations, etc., they are very similar to marriage problems. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> You, you, you have disagreements with your wife, and uh, when it, you try to solve it before you go to a third party. I mean, if you are at the third party stage, it means you have decided to divorce. So I, I, I think we have not even tried the first part yet. I mean, like with Iraq, now we are having you know, close cooperations. Even with Elusudam, you know, they came and visited. And we have joint technical committees. We have action plans. And it's a slow process. You know, you have to be patient. So, um, you know, getting the third party, international law, etc. I mean, if we could do it, uh, the things would not happen in uh, Ukraine right now, you know, if the international law works that effective. So, international law is there, I understand. 
But first, we have to get these two parties together before we're going to a referee, which will make things even worse. That's my personal idea. Thank you, Dr. Sachi. Danilo Turk, you're a professor in international law. The need for legal arrangements. What would you say about this call? <clears throat> yeah. Well, look, I mean, there are over 200 bilateral and regional arrangements on water cooperation already. So the <clears throat> legal systems are known. There are two major conventions, and I would like to especially emphasize a convention which is perhaps a little less known um, in, uh, among the two, that is the, um, the Economic Commission of Europe, ECE Convention on Water, which is now open, which was started as a European convention, but is now open to the whole world. And there are several countries from Africa and from Asia that are now joining, including Iraq, I understand, is in the process of joining that convention. So <clears throat> as far as a more general legal framework is concerned, it is not true that there is a vacuum. There is a broad uh, agreement. But then, of course, um, you know, these uh, agreements, these broad conventions have basically are based on two principles. One is rational water use rational and fair water use, and second, do no significant harm. So what would you hear when you talk to you know, people from different countries is that upper riparian countries will emphasize the first principle, no? if, if, rational water use. The lower riparian countries will usually uh, emphasize the other one, do no harm, do no significant harm, mm -hmm. which brings us to the marriage counseling metaphor of Dr. Sachi. I mean, there has to be a process that helps working out these tensions, uh, these uh, misunderstandings or whatever. Uh, sometimes uh, technical data can help. Sometimes they will not be sufficient. And again, the European Convention has a technical secretariat which can be helpful in that regard which is based on a broader legal framework, but can be tailored to a specific bilateral or regional needs. Now, <clears throat> none of this would work if the political will is not mobilized as well. And that is an artistic uh, question which requires, you know, again, region-specific approach. We have heard Prince Hassan of Jordan speaking about that at the beginning of our meeting this afternoon. I would like all of us to think about the wisdom of his, what he said. Thank you very much. Ambassador Dante, maybe, be, yeah, be, please. Maybe just as a thought, uh, because when there is dispute over basic goods, bring in the women, found a woman council, and say, what is the suggestion of the two parties, of the two countries, of the three, because it becomes it will be more to the pragmatic use of it and what you can make out of it. And it will be diverted a bit more from politics. You cannot, of course, make abstraction of politics. But if you have a good solution that people could live with, then maybe politicians will also buy it. That's probably already the first takeaway from today. Bring in women. Many thanks. We have time for one Final question, or two little one. There are two uh, women. Um, I, I didn't see whether the lady behind was first, but go first, and then we take your question as well, before we will then close this second part of this afternoon. Please, would you, yeah, okay, behind. You. Go ahead. My name is Lindsay, and I am the former president of the World Youth Parliament for Water, representing youth. Um, and I'm also a Water and Climate Coalition leader, also representing youth on a high-level panel. And um, a big thank you to SDC. They've been a big sponsor, so I know the exact value that you place on young people and the water sector. But my question is maybe for other panelists and asking the question of how do you value youth in the Blue Peace movement and in water, in water resources discussions, and specifically also what are additional opportunities um, that are provided to young people in these di diplomacy issues on water. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Who would like to take stand on that question? 
Well, actually, I have spoken about this in my initial remarks, in my keynote speech, and uh, later on also referring to specific examples. I think that one has to bring this to the to, to, to all levels, uh, and there will be opportunities now, uh, again, in the United Nations, with all the deficiencies of that system, I mean, the, the awareness is growing. I mean, I was involved in a uh, recent discussion about the Secretary General's uh, vision of our common agenda, and their, uh, men, their involvement of youth is really one of the central themes, and we'll talk about this directly later uh, with Lindsay, I'm very happy that we meet again and we'll discuss this in some detail. What I would like to say is there is no reason why this uh, involvement of youth should be left to the local level uh, aspects of the problem. No, this should be at all levels and, and there will be space for that. I guess the Fridays for Future has shown the power of youth in the politi political agenda. We are now coming to the very end of this session. We still have one question from uh, a lady up front here. Please have your Good final afternoon. question. Good afternoon. I'm May al Sayer from Lebanon. I'm a member of the Blue Peace Media Network and the Middle East since 2013. So based on what you have said, Excellency uh, Dancy, on the creating the case of emergency, um, um, we know that in the Rhine River it was the pollution what triggered the riparian countries to cooperate. Also in Senegal, it was the drought. The founding fathers uh, of the Senegal River Basin, it was the drought that motivated them to cooperate. Uh, in your opinion, and, uh, and based wha on what Dr. Sechi mentioned on uh, creating a publication, why as a, uh, يعني, why as a blue peace community move and movement, as you said, Your Excellency Daniello, why we don't create like a publication on the impact of climate change on the, in those countries, يعني, Iraq, Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. So people will see uh, the impact of climate change from here to five years. So what also uh, Dr. Ghattas Khouri mentioned, the importance of media. We as a journalist, when we see we have figures on the impact of climate change, we can uh, convince the public opinion to, be, uh, to demonstrate and ask for uh, transboundary water cooperation. Thank you. Maybe if you may, thank you for your remark. I think publication would not do. People, today's people don't read any more long publications unless they're scientists and contribute to a solution. But if you want to raise public opinion, you have to make a Twitter video or you have to show it on the video screen of all the major airlines while you're landing or departing. I think, and you need to tell people directly what they can do, because people want to know, what can I do? They feel so belittled. They say, you know me, poor this and that, what can I contribute? So you have to bring them to the action and to show it um, with, uh, with, with, with pictures and movements. Publication is good, but it's definitely not enough, especially when you talk about young people, social media, it's on Instagram, it's on TikTok, it's on Twitter. So you will have to combine it to, to, to bring it to, to the public. Can I just comment on this? Of course, the publication, it's like uh, the, يعني, the foundation to use the media, you have the f you need the figures, you you need scientific approach, so that we as the media persons, we can convey these messages. Yeah, it's our role, but I'm saying that we need a scientific and foundation to lay this message. Thank you. Many thanks. We are coming to the end of this second part. I would really like to thank all the panelists, the keynote speakers. You may take your seat, and thank you very much for having joined us here. Now, please have a seat. We are at the, uh, close to the end of the second part of this afternoon's program. We will have, before we stand up and move on, we'll still have a Final wrap-up of Ambassador from Ambassador Massimo Bacci. I would like to announce then, after this final wrap-up, we would go into three groups. 
down, taking the elevators, and we would start with a group uh, which is led by a colleague, Katya, you may turn and you see the, the woman, the colleague who raises her hand. The first third or the last third of the participants would kindly follow uh, our colleague Katya. And then we have a second group which will be followed by our colleague Manuel Salkli. He's raising hands over there. And we have a third part who will be led by Nicolas Biro, head of President Switzerland, he has raised the hands. We go through the we go through the, the Swiss pavilions. Just in front of the Swiss pavilions, we would like to take a picture. So we would kindly ask you to move a bit quickly so uh, that those who are waiting out downstairs do not get burnt in the sun. Um, and then we will move in and let me finish. Let me finish. Wait a second. We're not, we're not done yet. Please have a seat. Have a seat. We will then go to this Blue Peace exhibition and after this we'll come up here for the cocktail reception. So do not forget to take the elevator after the presentation and come here for the cocktail receptions. You're all invited to join us in the cocktail reception. Before we stand up, however, once again, I would like to invite Ambassador Massimo Bacci for a final words and many thanks for your attention. Dear friends, I stand in front of you after a very rich afternoon of fascinating debate. And more than that, I'm perfectly aware that I stand in front of you between uh, the conclusions and the cocktail. And believe me, I perfectly know where we have to put uh, the priorities now. But uh, let me say a few words about uh, eventually a few messages that uh, we can take with us when we go around the pavilion and after the cocktail. When the UN turned 70 years old, it was in 2015, it launched its uh, Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development with uh, 17 major goals. One of those is goal number six. It says, access to safe drinking water and sanitation is a human right. Yet, with two people, two million, billion people uh, without uh, deprived from enjoying it, we are off track. That means that uh, access to safe drinking water and sanitation is not a human right, or not yet a human right. We still have a few years. And is any one among us ready now to take this responsibility to get there and to fail to agree that we absolutely need to fulfill uh, this goal. I think that we are not ready to do uh, that. And I think that uh, today we discuss many challenges, but we also discussed a few way forward, a few solutions that we can uh, implement. And uh, I think that uh, one of the way forward is probably to scale up a few of the opportunities that we have been discussing today, not only technical solutions, but also idea in terms of uh, movements that can be upgraded to uh, get there. And to bring uh, those upscaled actions uh, up to the next target that we have in front of us. Uh, the Water Forum in Dakar is a few weeks ahead of us. And in 2023, we have the UN Water Conference. So let's take these targets and let give us a chance to change our uh, behavior. Because I think that we have to, to go through uh, that. And I think that Thunberg was right. 
without that change in our behavior, we will not be in a position to implement uh, those uh, ambitious uh, targets. And, uh, you know, we did it for the pandemic. So now I don't wish you another two years of lockdown to implement SDG number six. But I think that we can compromise a little bit on our behavior in order to give all of us, to all of us, the chance to get closer to that uh, target. So with these uh, words of hope, hopefully, I would like also on behalf uh, of uh, uh, the government of Switzerland that I represent here uh, together with the Swiss Pavilion and together with all uh, the partners that we had, not only the Swiss uh, Development Corporation, but the many partners that uh, we had from government, from the pirate sector, I would like to thank you because this is exactly the stakeholders that we need all together to go forward. So thank you very much again for giving us the chance to be better persons uh, today and to forget, not to forget that we have to keep going on because the target ahead of us are very, very ambitious. Thank you so much. Enjoy the Swiss Pavilion and the cocktail afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>